the effects of this pandemic will be far reaching and it will be interesting to see how it changes our social responses and behaviors in the aftermath and how long these changes endure. Will the rise of COVID-19 and the eventual development of a vaccine be the nail in the coffin of the anti-vaccination movement? Will we become more conscious of disease transmission in general, replacing handshakes with bows or fist bumps and imposing new hygiene practices in schools? Will stockpiling supplies go mainstream with people looking to prepper culture as a model of how we should all live? Will COVID-19 result in the long-term tightening of borders and change the nature of globalization and international migration? Or will it just be business as usual two years down the road? I was just quoting medical anthropologist Jen Pilipa from her article, A Week in the Life of COVID-19 in Ottawa, Canada, which was published just last month, that's June 2020, in a publication called Anthropology Now. Um, I mentioned in an earlier video in the series that academia is kind of slow. It usually takes months, maybe even years, after research is done for an article based on that research to be published. So anthropologists don't break stories like journalists do. Instead, they provide in-depth analysis of stories that have already been broken, I guess. So Anthropology Now, the, the publication that those quotes appeared in, that's a, it's a peer-reviewed journal, but it's a bit faster than most journals. The articles are shorter. Uh, they're meant to be more readable, more accessible than most academic articles are. And the whole thing is meant to be you know topical. So that's why they were able to have a special issue all about COVID-19 just two months after the pandemic shutdowns began. Um, that special issue that I've been quoting from, it's called An Anthropology of the COVID-19 Pandemic, and it includes the article I just mentioned by Jen Pilipa, plus about 12 other articles in which anthropologists share their insights on what COVID has looked like in the places where they live and do research. So the piece I was quoting a minute ago by Jen Pilipa, that piece is about Ottawa. That's the one that is probably the most familiar to most of the viewers of this video. And uh, that anthropologist tells the story of that week in March that I'm sure everyone remembers, even though it feels like years ago at this point, maybe. Um, you know, moments like grocery shopping and figuring out childcare with this, this the onset of this global pandemic kind of, uh, you know, looming in the background. Um, she admits to doing some panic shopping, which everyone did and no one admitted to and everyone frowned on others for doing. But, you know, we all did it and we all also bought into the fantasy that none of this would last very long. I shouldn't say all, not like every single person did, but I guess as a society, many of us bought into that fantasy that it was uh, going to be over and done with somewhat soon, maybe. In fact, our own leaders encouraged us to view it that way. So Pilipa notes, for example, how on, uh, on Thursday, March 12th, Ontario Premier Rob Ford uh, basically told everybody in the province to go ahead and go on vacation for March break, which was starting, you know, a couple of days after that, and uh, to have a wonderful time. And then later the very day that he said that, he canceled school for two weeks after March break. Uh, there was still school the Friday, the, the day after he said that, but then March break happened, and, uh, well, I'm speaking now in late July, and it's kind of uh, still March break for the kids. I think it was when the NBA, the National Basketball Association, when they announced they were canceling the rest of their season on March 11th, that's when things really started to sink in for a lot of people. Um, for my part, I taught my last regular in-person class on Thursday, March 12th. And at the time, I think I kind of expected to be back with the same students that following Tuesday, that following Thursday, I mean, or, you know, if not then, then in, in a couple of Thursdays. But... Instead, I was uh, soon kind of prodded into this new role of professor slash online content creator, which is now becoming kind of the new normal. I hate that phrase. I shouldn't have said that. Just, yeah, I didn't say that. Um, anyway, regardless of how you feel about that phrase, the new normal, I mean, the idea of commuting to a campus on crowded public transit to go talk to 150 people in a crowded lecture hall, that being my job that was so normal for you know quite a few years, now seems almost surreal. And anyway, there's there's so much more I could say about COVID, but this video is not about just COVID. It's about medical anthropology. Um, this is just here as an example of what medical anthropologists study and how they study it. So the last episode of this series, which will be episode 21, is about the idea of the Anthropocene. Uh, 
the concept that we've you know sent the planet into a whole new geological epoch with uh, our industrialization and now there's this so the editors of that issue of anthropology now that i've been talking about uh, as they put it they say this disease has not rendered humans powerless but it certainly seems to have shifted the balance of power to the point that maybe we should also be talking about what they call the corona scene as if the coronavirus has you know set off a new I don't know if they want to call it an epoch or an era or whatever. It's it's a new thing of its own, maybe. Um, make up your own mind. I'm not sure I buy the idea that we're in something called the corona scene. Maybe it's people, you know, having a bit too much fun with this making up new words for new scenes thing. Um, I don't know. It's also all a little bit depressing, so maybe it's a good time to pause and run that upbeat intro segment that I like starting my episodes with. So let's do that and then get back to this episode's main topic, which is medical anthropology. Listen up, everybody. It's time. Please welcome. Introducing. Making sense. Are you ready for it? Of a changing world. Wow. Okay, okay. 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 Anthropologists. This episode is an introduction to medical anthropology. In other words, the study of how people understand health and illness, what they do about it, and how their options are shaped by the structural conditions in which they live. A lot of this episode will be case studies of work done by medical anthropologists across the globe. Uh, We'll look a lot at Canada and how the concept of the social determinants of health can explain how health is about much more than just exercising and eating well. So we'll look at that one. We will look at how Cree communities around James Bay understand health, according to the work of medical anthropologist Naomi Adelson. And then we'll go through some international examples, um, how people live with hunger and disease in a very poor community in Brazil, and also spirit possession in Malaysia, or more specifically, women making computer parts in sweatshops who get possessed by spirits and have to stop working until the spirit leaves their body and they're back to normal. Which probably sounds more like the anthropology of religion, maybe, but like I'll explain later on in the episode, this is a public health issue in that local context as well. Um, I'll talk briefly about the anthropology of disability, as it appears in Renegade Dreams by Lawrence Ralph, which will be a bit of an addition to the last episode, which focused entirely on that ethnography. And in the end, we'll come back to COVID briefly, and I'll try to close somehow on a sort of positive note, somehow, some way. So one of the many threads connecting these examples is the idea that health is culturally constructed and socially determined. So looking cross-culturally, anthropologists have found huge variations in what it means to be healthy. Some meanings of health are unique to a specific culture. Others are shared by many different cultures. But either way, all understandings of health are culturally constructed. Of course, there's a strong biological component to health. I mean, we, we have bodies, bodies get sick, bodies break down. There are proven methods for making them feel better or work better or, or last longer. But understanding what the problem is and how to solve it, that's what's specific to the time and place, and it changes over time. So that's health as something that is culturally constructed. Now, on the other side of the same coin, health is socially d- determined. And this is where we look at structural conditions. So back to structure and agency, as I've been emphasizing through a lot of these recent episodes. All societies have at least some measure of social inequality. And in any given society, some people are more likely to be healthy than others by the society standards of what health is, of of course. And these two points tend to overlap. So wealth and power tend to correlate with health. We'll look at some research from here in Toronto on the social determinants of health, how structural variables like income and place of residence impact health among the population. That's all coming up a bit later. Now, just to emphasize the point, remember this identity and inequality diagram from earlier episodes in the series. These are the things that make up a person's identity, and they are also the things that shape patterns of inequality at both the local and the global levels. And they all play an important role in how people understand health, how they experience health care, and in some cases, how likely they are to be healthy. And now a bit of review this emic and etic idea from earlier in the series. Uh, just to review in brief, the emic, that is the insider perspective, and the etic is 
the outsider perspective. The insiders are the people being studied, and the outsider is the anthropologist. So the emic is the worldview that we're trying to understand. The etic is the anthropologist's interpretation, which itself is shaped by the anthropologist's own worldview. And what anthropologists try to do is interpret the emic on its own terms, and then see how it relates to the etic and what it can tell us about ourselves. I think it's easy to get these two confused, and it's also easy to assume that our etic ideas are shared everywhere, especially for something like health, which seems like a fairly straightforward idea, but is actually not straightforward or kind of universally uh, uniform at all. I'll say a few things about medical anthropology itself. It is a sub-branch of sociocultural anthropology that's been growing since the 1980s. Um, it studies the, the wide range of experiences and the practices that people associate with, with disease and illness and health and well-being. And it's sort of centered around asking a few key questions. So medical anthropologists ask questions like, how does culture shape our ideas of health and illness? Uh, how can anthropologists help solve healthcare problems? What's the relationship between health and illness and wealth and power? And how does globalization factor into all of this? So we'll start with that first key question. How does culture shape our ideas of health and illness? First of all, what is health? And to begin with that, we can talk about it in terms of the emic and the etic. If you are somewhere in the West, like I am, I'm, I'm making this video in downtown Toronto, that's, you know, part of the West, you can say that here in the West, our etic definition of health would probably match that of the World Health Organization, and they define it as the absence of disease and infirmity, as well as the presence of physical, mental, and social well-being. That's a good definition to start, but it's not very anthropological. Um, some things that it misses, it doesn't really address the fact that almost no one lives in a state of complete health, or that your position in society has a strong influence on how close you can come to that ideal state of well-being, but we'll come back to that point later. Um, we'll also look at some examples of emic understandings of health, how specific cultures understand what's good for you. Some emic views of health emphasize some parts of the World Health Organization's definition over others. Uh, some aren't really translatable, and there is huge variation between them. But one key finding of medical anthropology is that the way a society understands how health works is very closely related to how that society understands how the world works and how they understand the relationship between an individual and their community. Here's a classic example of how health is culturally constructed. It's a book called Birth in Four Cultures. Uh, as the title suggests, it's a study of birth in four cultures, uh, the Yucatan, which is a state in Mexico, the United States, Holland, and Sweden. So as you may have predicted, these four cultures handle birth quite differently. I'll begin with the example that's probably the most familiar to most people watching this, the United States, and, and this also pretty much applies to Canada. North American biomedicine tends to treat childbirth as a medical emergency. So 98% of American children, for example, at the time this book was written, were born in hospitals. The person giving birth is seen as a patient, and pregnancy itself is treated almost like a health problem. There are specific professionals whose job it is to handle specific aspects of pregnancy, childbirth, and a newborn's first few days. There are ultrasound technicians, uh, nurses, anesthesiologists, breastfeeding consultants, doctors. These are all trained professionals, and they have varying degrees of power and respect among them, and also a clear hierarchy among them. But they all have power over the patient to at least some extent. And until recently, there hasn't been much of a role for the, the other parents or relatives or community members in the process of giving birth in, in, in this Western biomedical model. Um, again, one of the main insights of medical anthropology is that the way we view medical issues tells us a lot about the way we think society works. So I'm not going to answer this question, but I would just recommend thinking about it. Th think about what parallels you might be able to draw between how North America usually handles childbirth and North American culture and worldviews in general. Next example is indigenous communities in Yucatan, Mexico, where childbirth is mainly handled within the family unit. People usually give birth at home with a midwife. Uh, the co-parent and the mother of the pregnant person also have specific and important roles in the process. 
And again, you can see this as a reflection of how that society works. Um, arguably, people there have a more family and community-oriented worldview than Western biomedicine does. So that's the, the model of, of childbirth in, in the Yucatan, Mexico. And then there are the Dutch and the Swedish models of childbirth, which I think are somewhere, they're both somewhere in the middle of these first two that I've described. Uh, in Holland, for example, birth is not seen as a medical emergency. It still usually happens in hospitals, but there's much less intervention in the process and also apparently no pain medication. Meanwhile, Sweden's model is pretty much the same as Holland's, but with pain medication. So that's just a very quick summary of an example of how different healthcare practices can be. Even in three places in the West, the USA, Holland, Sweden, three places in the West that have quite different approaches to childbirth. And the way that it's done in the Yucatan is much closer to how it was done through most of human history. It's an approach to childbirth involving midwifery which is an approach that has been kind of rediscovered in recent decades in the West and is now becoming more common. Um, in most of the West, people had started to abandon midwifery in favor of the medical model by about the early 20th century. But as time went on, there was a growing movement in support of midwifery as a valid option, especially since the 1970s, and it's been officially recognized and regulated in Ontario since 1994. Uh, there was a report in 2010 that found that midwives earned 20% less than medical professionals in comparable jobs, and that disparity has, has increased since to as much as 48%. So midwives in Ontario earn between 82000 and 107000 a year. Compared to family physicians at community health centers who do obstetrics, uh, they earn between one hundred ninety-two to $220,000 a year. Uh, in 2013, the Association of Ontario Midwives took this issue to the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal, arguing that this is gender pay discrimination because their services are largely provided by and for women. Uh, the tribunal agreed and in February 2020 ordered the provincial government to increase midwives pay by 20% as a first step and also do more research to determine the current state of the pay gap. And that was all upheld in court uh, just recently in June 2020. Um, this part of the backstory is in the past, the, the Doug Ford government had challenged earlier findings of the tribunal while also cutting funding to the Association of Ontario Midwives. Anyway, that should all cover the first main point. Health is culturally constructed, so let's move on to the next one. Health is socially determined. An anthropologist came to that observation by asking key questions like this one. If the distribution of health and illness cannot be explained solely on the basis of genetic vulnerabilities, individual behaviors, and the random spread of pathogens through a population, then what are the root causes of health disparities? That, that quote is from a textbook by Kenneth Guest. A very brief look at the recent history of health around the world can help us answer that. The short version is the 20th, 20th century saw something called the health transition. So worldwide, overall human life expectancy increased from 31 years in the year 1900 to 65 years in the year 2010. But from 2012 stats, there are huge disparities in life expectancy from place to place. So Japan's life expectancy was the longest at 82.7 years, and Sierra Leone's was the shortest at 44 years. So overall, at a species-wide average, the average human is living more than twice as long now as they did 120 years ago. But in the present, one country's life expectancy is almost twice as long as another's. So why is that? Well, medical anthropologists argue that it's because economic and political systems, race, gender, class, and the other things on my identity diagram, all of that creates unequal access to health care. Medical anthropologists also look at how health systems themselves are systems of power that generate disparities by defining who is sick, who gets treated, and how, and those huge disparities in health play out at a global scale and also within local contexts. Which ties back into one of the points I mentioned a little while ago that health is culturally constructed and also socially de determined, and this is us getting into the socially determined side of things. So I want to spend some time on what that looks like in Canada, and for that I'm turning to a different but closely related discipline, the sociology of health. Uh, this report is called The Social Determinants of Health, The Canadian Facts 
from 2010, so it's a bit dated, but it's still relevant. It's based on research that looked into the things that tend to make some Canadians healthier than others. Uh, the report is about 63 pages long. It's actually very readable. I recommend checking it out on your own time. And in the meantime, I'll give you a summary. Each chapter focuses on one variable and how that variable contributes to your likelihood to be healthy. And those variables are income, job security, working conditions, early childhood development, food insecurity, social safety net, health services, Aboriginal status, gender, race, and disability. So parts of this list should look familiar if you've been watching this series because the list looks like our identity wheel from earlier in the series. Many of the things listed here also appear on that identity wheel diagram. Uh, others are different words for the same thing. And the point of that identity diagram was that the things that anthropologists study, the things that make up a person's identity, are also the things that structure patterns of inequality, both at a global level and within specific societies, including Canada. So I'll summarize some of their key findings, and then I'll get into their advice on uh, how to be healthy, basically. So here's a quote from this report that I think sums up the main point of what they're getting at. They write, For years, we bragged that we were identified by the United Nations as the best country in the world in which to live. We have since dropped a few ranks, but our bragging continues. We would be the most surprised to learn that in all countries, and that includes Canada, health and illness follow a social gradient. The lower the socioeconomic position, the worse the health. So now I'm going to show you some of the more interesting stats from this report. Um, if you look at it yourself, it provides more background and more context for them and some even more interesting stats. Some of them establish a clearer link than others. But overall, I think they point to a pretty convincing argument that being poor in Canada is one of the worst things for your health. To start with job insecurity, men in the wealthiest 20% of neighborhoods in Canada, for example, live on average more than four years longer than men in the poorest 20% of neighborhoods. And among women, that same comparative difference is about two years. Uh, the suicide rate was almost double in the low-income neighborhoods, and the overall death rate 28% higher. Uh, the report also found that job insecurity is bad for your health. And as we've been discussing in, in recent episodes, the transition to a neoliberal economy has brought a lot of job insecurity for a lot of people. Um, so on that note, these are 2010 numbers. The report said that only half of working age Canadians have had a single full-time job for six months or more at the time of that report. Um, the rest were working in, in, in part-time or temporary or, or, or self-employed. Um, and remember a couple of episodes ago, I mentioned a more recent report that said that less than half of Canadians aged 25 to 54 now have full-time year-round jobs. It might be surprising to learn that Canada is especially bad on this point in international context. So there's a global organization called the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And one thing it does is it has this index to compare how well a country protects employment and supports temporary workers. So Canada performs very poorly on that index. It ranks 26th out of 28 nations. Um, unemployment is related to poor health. It causes, obviously, material deprivation and poverty, plus the physical and the mental stress that come with, with losing a job. So unemployment and unstable employment are bad for your health, and Canada is pretty bad at protecting people from these things. The report also studied food insecurity, which an estimated 9% of Canadian households experience. And the risk of experiencing food insecurity is especially high in one-parent families and in families receiving social assistance. With regards to housing, the report called the housing situation in Canada a crisis. So housing is officially unaffordable if you spend more than 30% of your total income on housing costs. And 42% of Toronto, for example, lives like that. Besides the stress of trying to make rent, low-income housing also tends to be low quality. It's more likely to have lead and mold and poor heating and poor air quality, uh, vermin, overcrowding, all things that are bad for your health. Uh, children who live in low quality housing are at a greater risk of, of poor health outcomes both in childhood and when they grow up. Now, it, it's not easy to separate out the effects of housing from other factors because, you know, poverty and poor housing and pre-existing illness all tend to go together often. But even when taken on their own, poor housing conditions on their own can cause 
health problems as well. What often happens when people live in poverty and in poor housing conditions is one problem causes another, which causes another. And then there's this kind of chain reaction that adds up to, to like a poverty trap. And I've also found that anytime poor people are suffering due to a preventable problem, someone else is peddling an overpriced solution to that problem that doesn't actually solve it. And I think one example of that is bug spray as shown here. Through most of my life uh, living in you know big apartment buildings, one of the biggest fears that people in these buildings have is uh, is cockroaches. Roaches are disgusting; they're they're hard to get rid of. If you have one, you have many more. Uh, but the good thing is, roaches are relatively easy to poison because they eat anything, and they they this is kind of gross, but they clean themselves. So the current approach is to to bait cockroaches with with a poison gel. So the roaches eat the gel. And then they, they kind of spread it around to their friends, and in a couple of days, they're all dead. So that works well with roaches. It doesn't work, however, with bed bugs. Now, bed bugs had largely vanished from North America until about 15 years ago. And now that they are back, uh, I think they almost make cockroaches look cute by comparison, right? So if you've ever had bed bugs, you know what hell that is. They are a hazard to your mental health at the very least. And worst yet, some people are also allergic to their bites. Um, they're also very, very hard to get rid of in part because they don't clean themselves. And the only thing they live off is blood. So there's no way to trick them into eating poison like there is with roaches. Um, to make matters worse, bed bugs can hide almost anywhere. They can live for months without feeding. So once you have them, the only way you can be absolutely sure they're gone is basically to throw out your mattress, throw out most of your furniture, and wash every piece of fabric in your house in hot water, and then dry it on high heat, often several times. Uh, the property manager of, of the building you're in also has to be very proactive and fumigate not just your apartment, but all the apartments around you to truly deal with the problem. Now, they're legally obligated to do that, but it's expensive and it's not easy to force a landlord to do something they don't want to do, even if it is, you know, legally binding. So here's the point. Everyone is equally vulnerable to bed bugs. No matter how rich or poor you are, they are in low-income housing projects. There are five-star hotels everywhere in between. And no matter how clean you keep your place, it will not help prevent bed bugs because they don't care about food or, or dirt. They're, they're not attracted to that. All they want is blood, and everybody has blood. So what's the connection to medical anthropology and poverty and the social determinants of health? Well, here it is. Um, you know, everybody is vulnerable to bed bugs, but not everybody is equally able to get rid of them. Not everybody has the time and the money to replace their bed and their furniture and then wash everything they own perhaps several times. And uh, landlords who own low income or sorry, landlords who own low quality housing are overall s largely less likely to invest money in being proactive about pest control. So that's why bed bugs are often a symptom of poverty. And worse yet, like I said, for every problem poor people have, someone else has a, a scam to exploit that problem, basically. And that's what I'm trying to show with this slide. So this, this bottle of regular bug spray for ants, for roaches, for earwigs is $9.99. And those are the kind of pests that, that worry, you know, middle class and wealthy homeowners as well as the poor. But the exact same size and bottle of bed bug killer is twelve forty nine, and those are the kind of pests that aff afflict poor people disproportionately and that will make you willing to try anything and spend any amount of money to get rid of because they are so stubborn and so hellish to live with. Now look, I can't prove it, but I suspect that maybe that's why the bed bug killer is 20% more expensive. On the issue of healthcare accessibility, Canadians often say they are proud that we have universal healthcare, but what we really have is publicly insured healthcare. The principle is that all Canadians should have equal access to any healthcare services that are deemed medically necessary. But the provinces get to decide what's medically necessary, and that changes over time. So one example, eye exams used to be covered in Ontario, but since 2004, we need to pay for those ourselves. So apparently eye exams aren't medically necessary, but anybody who wears glasses or contacts, you know, well knows that it's kind of a necessity to get through your life if you need those things. Your access to doctors is also different uh, based on income. So the bottom 33% of Canadian income earners are half as likely to see a specialist when they need to. 
as, as compared to the top 33% of income earners, for example. Uh, the lower income earners are twice as likely to have a hard time getting health care on weekends or evenings and are also 40% more likely to wait five days or more for an appointment with a physician. With regards to gender and ethnicity, there are many stats on this. So I'll show you a couple of highlights. The average income of indigenous men in 2001 was just under $22,000, which was 58% the average for non-indigenous men. Uh, for indigenous women, that average was just under 17,000, 72% of the average of non-indigenous women. And remember that being a low income earner puts you at a greater risk of many health problems. With regards to gender, uh, women in Canada experience more of the social determinants that can have a negative impact on health than men do, and some of the main reasons for that are employment related. Women carry more responsibilities for unpaid domestic labor, which means raising children and taking care of housework. Women are also less likely to be working full time and are less likely to be eligible for unemployment benefits. So what this all boils down to is, if you want some medical advice from uh, an anthropologist, that the best way to, to be healthy in Canada is, uh, is to not be poor. So if you can avoid poverty, I highly recommend avoiding poverty. It's a, it's a great way to be healthy in Canada, not being poor. Well, that and, you know, take your supplements and uh, stay hydrated, always. Okay, but seriously, of, of course there's lots you can do for your health. Um, Plant-based whole foods diet, regular exercise, the, the vitamins, the supplements, the um, not looking at your phone for a couple of hours before bed, drinking lots of water, as I said. Uh, you know, minimal alcohol, no drugs, no tobacco, etc. That, that's all good and it all matters, of course. But the authors of that report are adamant that the best way to be healthy is to not be poor. So how do we help the greatest number of people possible uh, avoid poverty and thus avoid some of the biggest health risks? Well, those solutions, of course, are political, according to that report. So the report's recommendations boil down to this. I'll read you a couple of quotes from the conclusion. They say, The primary means of promoting the health of Canadians is through enactment of public policies that provide the living conditions necessary for good health. And it goes on to say that uh, public policies that would improve the quality of the social determinants of health are not pipe dreams. They have been implemented in many wealthy industrialized nations, most of which are not as wealthy as Canada and to good effect. So not only can we look to other nations that apply a social determinants of health perspective, we can look to the time from the Great Depression to the period after World War II, when Canada implemented Medicare and public pensions, unemployment insurance, and federal and provincial programs that delivered affordable housing. Governments on the political left, so the NDP basically, are more likely to enact policies that are good for the health of low-income earners. Uh, strong labor unions are also a, a key factor in, in providing benefits and protecting people against precarious employment. They're, so they're also good for your health, arguably. So as I've repeated over and over again through the course, the, the mid-20th century uh, was the, that, that moment when, um, well, the, you know, the sort of late, early to mid-20th century, whatever, that's the moment when the Canadian governments enacted those policies that the authors of, the, of that report say are the best way to promote public health. That was the peak of the Keynesian welfare state. So I guess the authors of that report want us to go back to something like that. The trouble is it's completely contrary to the neoliberal logic that almost every state in the world has embraced to at least some extent over the past 30 or 40 years. So all of that was the situation in 2010. So now fast forward a decade to the present and um, COVID-19 is kind of like salt in all of these wounds, basically. And this fact is, is coming out already in our mainstream media coverage. So look at the CBC article, for example. One country, two pandemics. What COVID-19 reveals about inequality in Canada. So the CBC did a study of infection rates in Montreal, and they found that rates are higher in low-income neighborhoods and in neighborhoods with higher percentages of black residents um, those communities have four times the hospitalization rates. Uh, Toronto Public Health found pretty much the same thing in Toronto back in April as well. And this one hits close to home for me, how one of Toronto's COVID-19 hotspots is struggling through the pandemic. It's about the Thorncliffe Park neighborhood that I talked about in the episode about neoliberalism. Uh, Thorncliffe is particularly at risk because the, the housing and employment situation of the people who, who live there put them at greater risk. Uh, the article quotes a doctor at a nearby hospital as saying, quote, it became quite clear to me that COVID-19 disproportionately impacts people with health inequities. Uh, 
things such as housing, income, and racialization. So Thorcliffe, as I said a couple of episodes ago, it, it's a neighborhood of huge apartment buildings and where a lot of people work in, in, in healthcare, in the service industry, and or the gig economy. There is a local poverty rate of 45%, which is double that of Toronto as a whole. So it's a case study in the social determinants of health. A neighborhood with that profile is at a uniquely high risk of, of COVID-19. Next topic is globalization and healthcare practices. I'll keep this brief. Uh, the short version is a lot of the out ideas I outlined in episode 11, globalization, also apply to what's happening to healthcare around the world. So all over the world, we're seeing cosmopolitanism in the ways that people take care of themselves and each other, a blending of local and international approaches to health systems. But you also see a good measure of cultural imperialism and neocolonialism, and there are disparities in health at a global level, such as that wide span of, of life expectancy from country to country, as, as I've already mentioned. But for now, I want to get back to culture with some case studies from around the world in how health is culturally constructed and socially determined. The first is spirit possession in microchip factories in Malaysia. So here's the context for this story. Malaysia is a Southeast Asian country that was largely rural up until the early 70s when the government started to restructure the economy to make it more industrial and what they called modern. So Iwa Ong was an anthropologist who studied what life was like for Malay women who moved from the countryside into the cities to work in factories. Even before they became urbanized, these women's cultural background was a product of globalization and cosmopolitanism. Their, their worldview and their religious beliefs were this unique local blend of indigenous and Hindu and Muslim influences. All of that included beliefs in spirits that can possess people's bodies when something has gone wrong or when someone is vulnerable or when someone is in an unclean place. So Iwa Ong studied what spirit possession looked like in a microchip factory, which was owned by a Japanese business and operating in a free trade zone in Malaysia. So all of this is also, by the way, a textbook case of neoliberalism. The Malaysian government had, had, had so-called modernized, and it was allowing um, a business from a wealthier country in to set up factories without paying trade tariffs. And here is what would usually happen. Malay factory women who are seized by vengeful spirits explode into demonic screaming and rage on the shop floor. Management responses to such unnerving episodes include isolating the possessed workers, pumping them full of volume, and sending them home. Yet a Singapore doctor notes that a local medicine man can do more good than tranquilizers. Whatever healing techniques used, the cure is never certain, for the Malays consider spirit possession an illness that afflicts the soul. So before these women went to work in factories, spirit possession tended to happen to unmarried women. And then after you know the, the transition to factory work, it became something that largely happened to young unmarried women when they were at work in, in modern capitalist organizations. So one of the first things people often wonder when they hear this example is, you know, what's really going on here? Is this really spirit possession? Well, in response, I guess you could say there are a couple of different emic perspectives and an etic perspective. So to start with one of the emic worldviews, the one that is shared, it seems, by the women who work in these factories, is that they, they're possessed by spirits and they need a person called a bomo, which is like a folk practitioner of medicine. They need that practitioner to help them get rid of the spirit and make things right. So the, the bomo, the folk practitioner, that person is the main provider of health care. And now the Bomos are sometimes brought into these factories to restore business as usual. So it's, it's a health issue to them. As for the point of view of their bosses, we don't really get one clear summary of what management thinks of spirit possession at work. But if we had that, that would be another emic perspective, since they're also there in the factories as opposed to, you know, being anthropologists or otherwise kind of detached from the situation. But as I mentioned, the details we get in the article are their responses ranged from having bomos on site to intervene, to intervene, sorry, if spirit possession happens or sending the women home or giving them value. As for the etic, this is Iowa Ong's interpretation of what's really going on. She writes, spirit possession provides a traditional way of rebelling against authority without punishment. Spirit possession episodes may be taken as expressions of both fears and of resistance against the multiple violations of moral boundaries in the modern factory. They are acts of rebellion, 
symbolizing what cannot be spoken directly, calling for a renegotiation of obligations between the management and the workers. So in other words, it's workers' resistance, but it's expressed through this culturally specific local practice. But to the women involved, it's something you treat with medicine, so it's an example of how health is culturally constructed. This is a brilliant book by anthropologist Nancy Shepard Hughes, first published in 1992, called Death Without Weeping. It's over 500 pages long, it's very controversial, and it says a lot more than what I'm about to say, but for the purposes of, of, of this video, I'm going to summarize some of the main points that are most relevant to the questions that medical anthropologists ask. So Nancy Shepard Hughes was an anthropologist doing research for 25 years on and off in a favela in northeastern Brazil. Uh, favelas are huge informal communities built on steep hills and mountains in, in and around Brazilian cities. Uh, for the most part, they're very poor communities, and the northeast is the poorest region of Brazil. This is a very hard ethnography to read. It's very sad because she was doing research in a community where people were dying of thirst and starvation in the 1980s. So the part of the book that's, I think, the hardest to read and also the most controversial is the chapter about infant mortality because she was doing research in a place with a very high infant mortality rate. And I'll read you a quote from a book review of this ethnography that sums up the anthropologist's findings as to how people from that place make sense of infant mortality in light of their cultural context. So the quote goes, the most striking aspect of infant mortality on the Autu is the mother's acceptance of the death of their infants. They believe that some babies are simply born wanting to die. They lack the will to live, yet women continue to have children in an effort to replace the ones they lose. They are running as fast as they can simply to stay in one place. So part of the situation is that they are all very devout Catholics, so they're 100% sure that their babies go to heaven after they die and that they are better off there. So another aspect of this is to be able to cope with all the loss. Mothers cannot get emotionally attached to every baby. So the title of the book, Death Without Weeping, refers to how they don't develop emotional bonds to the babies that are not expected to live, but they do develop close bonds to the babies that are expected to live. So the bigger conclusion that Nancy Shepard Hughes draws from this, this is the, the very controversial part, is that the love of a mother for her baby is a cultural construction, not this kind of universal biological given. It's a very powerful cultural construction, and it's very real, but from a global perspective, it's a privilege that was not available to poor women in northeastern Brazil in the 1980s. Next example is Naomi Adelson's research on the idea of health that is shared by the James Bay Cree of northern Quebec. So to begin, uh, the biomedical paradigm, which is the, the mainstream way that many Canadians would understand what health is, that paradigm does not really match how the Cree define health. So as the anthropologist Adelson puts it, she writes, from a Cree perspective, Health has as much to do with social relations, land, and cultural identity as it does with individual physiology. So there's a word in the Cree language that does not fully translate into health, but instead it, it, it means health and politics and being Cree and other things kind of all at once. So the closest we can get to translating this into English would be the phrase being alive well, which is the title of Adelson's book about this. And that concept reflects the idea, as Adelson puts it, that, quote, health is political, and furthermore, uh, for the Cree, health is inseparable from being Cree. Or to put this in more concrete terms, for an individual in this community to be healthy, the land has to be well maintained, they have to be free to hunt and trap and do other things that the Cree had done for millennia before colonialism. And all of these things have been threatened since the early 1970s when the Quebec provincial government decided to build a huge hydroelectric project on Cree land without even asking the Cree. And ever since that, there's been a lot of conflict and compromises and broken promises. And for a detailed history of this and how it matters in the present, I highly recommend Naomi Adelson's ethnography, Being Alive Well. So for my last case study, I want to get back to renegade dreams, the topic of the last episode, Lawrence Ralph's ethnography of Gangland Chicago, as the title says. A lot of the book is about how people cope with a very high rate of gun violence. And Ralph notes that in the media, as well as academic research, you read a lot more about people who, who die from gun violence 
than people who survive gun violence but survive with acquired disabilities. And uh, to sort of frame that story and put it in context, Lawrence Ralph draws on this, this field of the anthropology of disability, so I want to include a bit of that uh, towards the end of, of this episode. Disabilities are most commonly understood through this lens, the medical model. So Lawrence Ralph summarizes that on, on page 126 of Renegade Dreams as he writes, Disabilities are physical conditions that reduce a person's quality of life and thus pose clear disadvantages to that person. So this is, I would say, kind of a commonsensical understanding of disability. If someone has trouble hearing or has trouble walking, it's, it's thought that that's because they have a physical condition that makes those things hard for them. So a hearing aid or a cane can make up for it. But it's not actually that simple. And Lawrence Ralph outlines some of the problems with this medical model of disability. So here's a longer quote from the same book, Renegade Dreams, that explains this. Lawrence Ralph writes, Disability scholars have long rejected the medical model of disability. Instead, they champion a rights-based model, which emphasizes people's personal adjustment to impairment and their adaption to a medical rehabilitative regime of treatment. So that's step one, is realizing that a disability is not necessarily suffering. People adapt, people find their way around. Next piece is key. These scholars view disability as an institutionalized source of oppression, comparable to inequalities based on race, gender, and sexual orientation. So they argue that it's not just an individual's actual impairments that render that individual subordinate in terms of social status, but it's socially imposed barriers, anything from inaccessible buildings to limited modes of transportation and communication to prejudicial attitudes. Those are the real problems. So bodies are different. All bodies have strengths and weaknesses. The concept of disability arises from the fact that most societies have an idea of what a normal body looks like and, and what it can do. And the normal, of course, is in quotes. So disability is something that is done to people. It's not something that originates in their body. Now, obviously, there are real physiological differences. So things like blindness and deafness and cerebral palsy, for example, those, those are real things. But it's how they gain meaning in the social context that makes them matter and that shapes what life is like for people who do have those those conditions. So let's think of another example. Is, is needing glasses a disability? Not really in Canada anyway, because we live in a society where most people who need glasses can afford them. And, you know, if you just put on glasses, you can do most things that people who don't need glasses can do. But to extend that example a bit, what if you can see very little or nothing at all? Well, on that note, I would like to... I'd like you to hit pause here and then watch the brief video that I've linked in the description. It's David Lepofsky talking about transit platforms in, in Toronto. So the point is blindness is a disability because it falls outside the spectrum of what we in the West think a so-called normal body can do. So we design our infrastructure for use by people within that so-called normal spectrum. And then we provide accommodations after the fact for people with disabilities such as blindness. So one response to this model is this approach to architecture called universal design. The idea that you can build things to be accessible from scratch so you don't need to go back later and add accommodations. So accessible things are good for everyone. Some people need them, some people benefit from them. So to continue with the example from that clip that I asked you to watch, according to David Lepofsky, Blind people need subway stations with two platforms, but they're probably safer for sighted people as well. Um, another example is these, these doorknobs that I have on the screen now. Some people need these because they don't have the strength or the dex dexterity to turn a, a conventional doorknob, or maybe they need to use a stick or a cane to open doors. But other people benefit from them. Even if you are able to turn a conventional doorknob, these ones with the handles, they come in handy when you're carrying something or pushing a stroller or, or something else. So some people need these so-called accommodations. Um, everyone else benefits from them. So we can take care of all of this all at once with what's called universal design. So that's the social model of disability. It's a progressive idea. It's made a huge difference in how accessible our society is. But it's not that simple, and Lawrence Ralph reminds us on that note of the value of the intersectional approach because, as he puts it, the disability rights movement has downplayed race and socioeconomic status. So he writes a lot about members of the Crippled Footprint Collective. These are a group of young men 
who have acquired disabilities as a result of gun violence. And one thing they do is talk to local youth to explain what life is like with an acquired disability and uh, to try to, you know, sort of expose the harsher realities of, of life in, in a gang, basically. So those young men in that situation probably have a lot in common with persons with disabilities who, who live outside of that community in more privileged communities. Um, but at the same time, their experience with disability is also very different based on class and ethnicity and how those things intersect with, with disability. Okay, I promised I would end this on a somewhat hopeful note, so let's do it. We're gonna go back to coronavirus and COVID-19. The medical anthropologist who I cited at the start of this video, Jen Pilipa, she, she noted some signs of hope in that article I quoted from about what it was like when the lockdown began in Ottawa in March. She talked about an emerging hopeful sense of community solidarity, in her words, and related to that also an emerging culture of responsibility. So people going out of their way to protect and take care of the more vulnerable members of their communities. And I'm very glad that's in there in the article, not just because it's nice, but I feel that it's going to be necessary to get us through these so-called unprecedented times, which are actually very precedented. Um, it's just been such an extreme kind of shocking situation that it might feel unprecedented, but, but the precedent was there. But more on that in the Anthropocene episode in a couple of weeks. So... I'm going to stop here with medical anthropology. Uh, there are now just four more videos left in this series. There's the anthropology of tourism, uh, next, next episode, the anthropology of the media, visual anthropology, and then finally the Anthropocene, which, which I teased at the start of, of this video. After those, I'll be up to something with this channel. I'm not sure exactly what yet, but when I figure it out, I'll be sure to announce it. And in the meantime, I want to thank you for watching. Um, keep taking care of yourself and your loved ones, and I'll be back in a couple of days with the Anthropology of Tourism.